Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity of uh, being able to speak to you this afternoon. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the meteorology that uh, we've encountered uh, in the Western English Channel over the last um, year. So 2020 is the year uh, that we've got our sights on at the moment. I will talk a little bit about uh, winter 2021 as well, because that will be freshest in our, in our memories. So just a little bit of background about um, sort of the, the time series stations that uh, some of the data that we'll be presenting here, um, are where they're situated. So um, some of us are, will be sat here up in Plymouth um, and the long-term time series that have been uh, inhabited, inhabited, I'm not sure that's the right word, but, but sampled by the Marine Biological Association and the uh, Plymouth Marine Laboratory for most of the last century and into this century um, are situated here. So this is uh, station L4. So L stands for local, 4 stands for, well, it's one of many stations, but this is the fourth one in the series. And then station E1, uh, which stands for England 1. This is the first on the time series uh, transect of stations. Uh, so this is about 20 nautical miles offshore of Plymouth. L4 is about four nautical miles off Rame Head, just to give you a bit of um, sort of geography there. And the Plymouth Marine Laboratory uh, also operate uh, other parts of the time series. So we've got an atmospheric time series now since 2014 at the Penley Point uh, Trinity House helipad hut. Um, so that's a picture of that one there, looking out into the uh, sort of the near part of uh, Plymouth Sound. Um, I've al already mentioned the pelagic time series that we um, we take measurements for at stations L4 and E1. So that's a, a picture of the CTD rosette sampler off the back of the quest on an uncharacteristically uh, flat, calm day. And then we've also got some benthic uh, time series stations uh, that we maintain. The, the, the sort of provenance of these goes back to about the 1950s, but there's there's also uh, sort of the restart of the time series was in the early part of the 2000s. So we maintain a benthic series at L4, um, sort of rain off rain head. This is called rain mud, uh, core sand, and Jenny Cliff. So that gives you an idea of what we mean by the Western Channel Observatory. If you're interested, I've put uh, on all of these slides uh, some uh, URLs to uh, to the various websites so you can uh, check up that this is where I'm actually getting the data from and if you're uh, interested in anything else about these. So let's talk about the, the regional picture uh, that we encountered back in 2020. What I'm going to take you through here is a, a set of um, maps that are produced by the UK Met Office um, and uh, they're pretty uh, instructive really about what the climatology is, has been over the, um, the period. So what we've got here, so this is uh, for the period um, winter 2020, so that's uh, December 2019 through to uh, February uh, 2020. Um, so this is the temperature, so the temperature will always be on the left hand side, the rainfall in the middle and the sunshine duration is always on the right of, of this plot and subsequent plots. And what we're looking at here is the temperature anomaly from the 1981 to 2010 um, period. So where the, the temperatures are in sort of the, the light red uh, or the pale pink, I suppose, up to the dark red, this is where you've got a positive anomaly, where you've got a negative anomaly in blue. Then this is the rainfall where you've got a positive anomaly in the blue, negative anomaly in the brown, and then sunshine duration where you've got uh, a positive anomaly again in the oranges and warmer color colors for more uh, or better than average, much, much higher than average. And then where you've got um, gray, this is where it's much lower than or lower than average or much lower than average. So that's just to give you a bit of um, orientation about this plot and the subsequent ones. If you want to download these and read much more about uh, the climate summaries, the URLs are provided um, down here. I believe that the slides will be av available at the end of this, but if not, please contact me directly and I can make them available to you. So first of all, it's, it's very clear from this slide here that um, winter 2020 was much warmer than average. And we were looking at about a degree to a degree and a half warmer in, in the southwest, the sort of the east of the country was very warm, uh, over two degrees warmer than average. 
but uh, on the flip side of it, it was also pretty wet. Um, so, so in our neck of the woods, we were sort of about 150% of the average rainfall down here. And then unsurprisingly, um, for the winter time, uh, it was pretty dull. So we had rain, um, sunshine totals uh, lower, and I'm not sure quite what the South Hams did to deserve it, but uh, they were um, much lower than average, sort of less than 80% of the average um, sunshine for that period during winter 2020. So if let's now look at the, um, the, the temperatures as the, how they panned out. So just to give you a bit of orientation here, because all these slides will be very similar going forward, is that the this is, the, this is the, the value that you need to be looking at if you were interested in the mean uh, value. So this is the mean value of temperature for the period 20, uh, 1981 to 2010. And then what we actually had are these, is this here in the dark blue. So you can see when the temperature was um, well above or above or well above average. Um, there's very few periods where the temperature was just below uh, the average for winter 2010. And in actual fact, if you look at this period here in early January 2020, you can see that uh, the, the temperatures were getting on to being sort of on a par with or just about exceeding the, the absolute records that we had for the period 20, uh, 1981 to 2020, 2010, and then just exceeding them here in the early or late part of January, early part of February. So that was uh, the winter 2019 into 2020. So now let's look at the spring. So spring kind of continued this theme of it being uh, warmer than average. So the period, uh, so the temperature that we're looking at here, we're probably about a degree, degree and a half warmer than average in our neck of the woods down here. But it was actually very dry. Um, so if you cast your minds back to the early days of uh, lockdown version one, um, you can see that the, 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 there was very little rainfall um, in, our, in our region. Uh, we're looking at sort of less than 70%, between 50 and 70% of the average rainfall. And then you can see that also, um, it was also very sunny, extremely sunny in that period. Um, so those are the statistics there. And then if we look at the temperatures, you can see that there were notable sort of warm periods. There was a, a the very, um, so this is when we, started lockdown was here it was pretty mixed to start with but then actually we went into a period of much much warmer weather uh, within about a week or so um, and then you can see that there were some notable periods of warmth in uh, sort of april so april was notably warm uh, and then sort of may but then when we went into the middle of may it was notably cold actually for a period of about a week before the temperatures uh, recovered somewhat now going into the summer, well, the summer actually was pretty notable by being pretty boring in terms of the, uh, the temperature. In fact, it was a little bit on the cold side for the period uh, July, uh, J June, July and August 2020. Um, so this was uh, this is the, uh, the temperature here that we're looking at. So between half a degree above and half a degree below. So nothing really of any note in our region, but it was quite wet. Um, we'll have a look at that a bit, bit more in a bit more detail a bit later on. Um, but you can see here that we had somewhere between 130 and 150 percent of the average rainfall. And also, as you'd expect, with that amount of rainfall that we had um, much less than the average amount of, of, of sunshine during summer 2020. And then looking at the, uh, the temperature anomalies, there was a notable heat wave in uh, sort of the mid part to the end of June. So this is this period here. We also had a notable heat wave sort of mid August. Um, this one here was, was, was quite notable, particularly down here as well in the Southwest uh, before things went quite wrong in terms of the temperature, in terms of the precipitation, in terms of actually, this is when we started having, there were named storms. We'll, I'll talk about that in a moment uh, in this period of August. Um, then, uh, Overall, July was the most disappointing of all the months. There wasn't anything uh, to give us much cheer during July 2020, colder um, and wetter than average in this period. And then going into the autumn, again, not much in the way of uh, temperature anomalies, so pretty much on the average uh, in terms of temperature for 2020, um, drier than average, just about. 
Um, and then sunshine totals pretty much what you'd expect for the average unless you lived uh, sort of in the South Hams. It seems to be a bit of an anomalous position um, part of the world at the moment. So there we go. Not quite sure why. And then looking at the temperatures again, um, sort of mid, there's a brief um, warm spell in mid September, um, sort of a, a more pronounced cold spell, uh, sort of to 22nd to the 29th of, or, and into early October um, here. And then sort of as we're going into uh, the, the end of the autumn in the beginning of, of winter, there was a, a, there was a notable uh, warm period in November. And then just finally, uh, this is a little bit off remit, but I was just talking about uh, the winter that we've just had. Surprisingly, actually, it wasn't particularly um, cold in this part of the world, although we had maybe a week or so in uh, February 2021 of, of some pretty cold temperatures. Overall, the winter was nothing to really write home about. Um, so that's pretty much over the entire country in actual fact. It was it was wetter than average, sort of somewhere between about 130, 150% of the average, and then uh, duller than average uh, for, the, for the entire of the winter. And then you can actually see the particular cold uh, phases that people will remember of this winter. This was, uh, I, I hate the phrase, but this was the beast from the east, Mark II. If you can remember Mark I, that was in 2018. Um, so we, we had temperatures fairly cold. I mean, there were, there were some fairly extreme colds in uh, places like Scotland where it got below minus 20 for consecutive days, um, but nothing really bad down here. Um, and then we had another, or, or we had the first cold phase of the winter really around about the new year um, period. There was quite a bit of ice and um, sort of colder, frosty temperatures um, early on sort of the middle part of it or sort of around the turn of the year. And then the end of the winter was very much uh, this rebound from the from the cold phase that we had up here. This, this is the real uh, change to talk about is that how we seesawed between pretty cold to, to being almost, you know, record warmth. So um, that was quite a, a feature of this winter that we've just had. So now let's uh, turn our attention to the local picture and what was the surface ocean meteorology doing? Um, so obviously winds are pretty important for us. So let me just take you through these diagrams here. This is, this is something called a wind rose and it gives you an idea at a glance where your uh, major uh, wind direction is coming from and also a, the strength of that wind and for how long those winds are sustained over. So this is for winter. 2019-20. So this is December 2019 through to February 2020. And you can see that uh, at a glance that the wind direction, the dominant wind direction was westerly. And in actual fact, what we can also see is that the, if you look at this, this is the wind direction here, uh, sorry, the wind speed here, this is in knots. So pretty much every color here will give you a Beaufort wind uh, for uh, wind um, uh, force. So uh, this, this uh, in orange here will be where we've got uh, severe gales to storm force winds. And you can just about work out that sort of there's been quite a lot of, of storm force winds in this period and um, sort, of, sort of more than a gale, um, maybe sort of five to 10% of the time over the entire winter, which is quite, if you think about it, that's that's quite a, a period of time. And there were sustained severe gales. In fact, this was February itself was the windiest February on record. And then if we go into, there's a real marked change going into uh, spring 2020. So whereas the winter was very much dominated by um, w winds from the south, uh, the west southwest, through west into west northwest, really dominated by winds from this direction in terms of um, time that it was in those quadrants, to the uh, sort of the spring period where we're getting we're starting to pick up these more uh, common southeasterlies, east southeasterlies um, for that period. Um, not particularly strong winds. So most of the winds were pretty light coming from this direction. So if you look at the, the color plots here, sort of most, mostly it's winds of force three or four and below 
in that quadrant there. Um, whereas, uh, and, and even when we were having westerly winds, as you'd expect, as you're going into the spring, that the wind uh, velocities or the wind speeds uh, drop off. It's just worth noting that the data here are from the Rainhead uh, National Coast Watch Institution station. We, we uh, look after a lot of their data and um, put a lot of their data on the web. If you're interested in looking in their real-time data, um, you can get hold of their data from here. This is the uh, web address on the right. And then going into summer 2020, we lose uh, this east easterly component almost entirely. Um, and then we can see that we're picking up much more again, uh, sort of the Atlantic um, weather systems. This is um, consistent with what we were seeing in the in terms of the temperature, um, the sunshine duration and the, and the rainfall that we were picking up a lot more rainfall, particularly in July 2020. And then you can see going into autumn, again, as you'd expect, the winds started to increase much more in terms of westerlies. And, and that sort of brings us to the end of that, that period there. So other things to note, um, storm naming has been sort of an annual fixture now for uh, Met Aaron and the UK Met Office, um, I suppose for about the last four or five years. Um, things have become a little bit more confusing now as all the other national Met agencies thought, well, this is a re really great idea. Um, and so the Spanish Met Service, the French Met Service, the Portuguese Met Service have kind of got in on this act. Um, but the problem for us becomes sometimes the storms get named and then we kind of lose track of things in terms of because it goes through the alphabet uh, naming them um, uh, sequentially. So uh, if you're interested, um, then you can get hold of what the um, storms were named uh, for any particular year uh, from this uh, website here. So the storms that we had during uh, 2020, so we had Storm Brendan, and I've put the, the central pressure in parenthesis here. So when we get anything really below about 960, that's quite a low pressure. So 940, uh, Storm Brendan, Storm Kira uh, was on the 8th and 9th of February, and that had a central pressure of 943. Storm Dennis, uh, a central pressure of 920. Now, this was um, a particularly stormy, rough period for us um, in 2020 because these were on subsequent weekends, if you remember. these Both these weekends were utterly dismal. Um, then we didn't really have much else in the winter of 2019-2020. Of um, and then we started picking up again, as I've already alluded to, um, there were two storms uh, of note in uh, August 2020. So this one here, quite a strong um, low pressure system of 966 um, millibars in August 2020 uh, for the time of year. And then Storm Francis uh, on the 25th of August, uh, probably wiped out a bank holiday weekend. And then we had um, in September and October, two storms that were named by, one by the French Met Office, so Meteor France, and um, one named by the Portuguese. So this is what really confuses our system because all of a sudden then we pick up Storm Aden on the 31st of October, 2020. Of note really, because this was um, former Hurricane Zeta. Now, if you cast your mind back to the back end of 2020, um, 2020 was quite a busy year in terms of um, hurricanes in the Atlantic. And it was the only, only the second year on record uh, that we had to start using the uh, Greek alphabet to name the storms. They've actually done away with that system now, if you're interested, um, but it was just, it was uh, symptomatic of a very busy uh, North, North uh, Atlantic uh, hurricane system uh, season. Then we had Storm Bella on Boxing Day this uh, last year. Um, that was quite uh, a notable storm. And then going into this year, uh, we had Storm Christoph. Uh, in January, and then Storm Darcy, which was forecast to bring us apocalyptic snowfall, and it really didn't amount to very much at all. Um, as I've already noted, sustained winds, it was the windiest February since records began, and there was flooding, notable flooding during um, February 2020. I just thought I'd show you this slide here, again from the data from uh, Rain Head. This is um, the, uh, the pressure time series from the NCI at Rame Head, 
and this was an all-time record uh, surface pressure for Plymouth, in fact almost for the country, I think it's only about two millibars off the all-time record of a thousand and fifty millibars, so that's quite some, uh, that's quite some record. Looking at the, uh, the wind uh, speeds that we, that we uh, got at Rain Head, uh, so this, this is drilling down, into, so I showed you the climatologies in terms of the wind roses, uh, this is to show really how windy or lack of wind I suppose it was during uh, some parts of 2020, but then if we look then to see where the storms came in, so this is Storm Brendan, Storm Kira, Storm Dennis, this was where we had the windiest um, February on record and you can see that there was no time really where the wind dropped out completely. Um, often the winds were well above about a force five and then most a lot of the time we were getting gusts in excess of 60, sometimes even 70 miles per hour or, or knots uh, at, at Rame Head. And then if we go to the other end of the, um, of the year, so this is uh, date or month of the year here, um, so this is August and September, you can see Storm Ellen and Storm Francis uh, coming in here with, the, with this sudden increase in the winds. Quite astonishing actually that we were getting gusts with Storm Ellen in August uh, above sort of 60 knots, but that didn't really last for very long. This is, this is in stark contrast to what we had in February. And then this is Storm Aiden and this is Storm uh, uh, Bella at the end of uh, 2020 uh, on Boxing Day. These data here show uh, what the wind, what the waves were, were doing. This is, so these, these data are actually from the Channel Coastal Observatory. This is from the Lou Bay um, uh, buoy, um, wave rider buoy. And you can see that this, so this is um, January, February. So this, this period here where we've got Storm Kira and Storm Dennis you can see that uh, the, the storm threshold of the, the, the wave height um, succeeded. So the, the wave height we reckon at um, Lou Bay is around about 3.75 meters. So we were exceeding it, um, particularly for Storm Kira, where we were getting waves approaching. So this is absolute maximum uh, wave height uh, between five and a half and six meters. If you're getting waves of that height in Lou Bay, it's quite some going. Um, sort of the significant wave heights around about four meters for that particular storm. Um, and then this was interesting. So when we get the storm uh, Aiden at the back end of, uh, of 2020, you can see again, there's, there's quite short lived, but quite, um, quite high um, wave heights that we got with that particular storm. So what does that mean for the hydrography at our long-term uh, time series sites at L4 and E1? So what I'm going to show you here are the, the various parameters that we measure. So first of all, L4. So L4 um, is here. So here's Rain Head. Uh, we're about four nautical miles offshore of Rain Head. And uh, here you can see the temperature, the salinity, the oxygen, the fluorescence, the transmission, so the transmission gives you an idea about how clear the waters is. So as, as they approach 100% uh, transmission, it means that the waters are very clear. If it's sort of about 50%, it means a pretty murky. And this is the, uh, the PAR. So this is the photo photosynthetically uh, available radiation uh, on, this, uh, on this plot here. Um, so just to take you through uh, some of the features of note, one of the things that we find at L4 is that when we get heavy rainfall um, and it works its way through the Tamar and down through the Tamar estuary and spills out into the Western English Channel, as you can imagine, it pours out through the, the, uh, the Tamar and then out in some kind of plume around uh, rain head. That, this is when we get to see uh, salinities that are much uh, lower than you expect. You expect salinity to be around about 35 at, um, at L4. So when we're getting salinities around about 34 and a half uh, consistently, that's when you can see that plume of, of, of rainfall. And then if you look in the transmission, that's where you're getting the more sediment that's being washed out and going down through the system and out into the Western English Channel. 
L4 is an interesting station um, hydrographically because it's seasonally stratified. So what do I mean by that? Well, during the winter period, so uh, is, which is really the period from about the end of September all the way through until uh, the end of March, so around about now, um, the water column is well mixed all the way through uh, its depth. So currently the, the water temperature will be about 10 degrees all the way through the water column. Whereas uh, as you get uh, longer days, as the sun gets uh, higher in the sky and gets stronger, then you start to heat up the surface layer. And that's when you start to get uh, this um, stratification. So the stratification period lasts from about early to mid April, all the way through until about September, uh, depending on whether or not you get big storms that wash through uh, or, uh, and, and, and mix up the water column. So this is the period of stratification. Um, and then you can see, I think Angus is going to talk a little bit more about this uh, in a moment. This is where we got a brief incursion of uh, coccolithophore bloom. So you can see the, the signature of the coccolithophore bloom in the fluorescence signature. So we're getting higher fluorescence here, high, high, um, higher values of oxygen, as you'd expect, lower values of transmission because the chalky liths of the coccolithophore bloom sort of scatter the light very well. And then um, sort of the, what its effect on the, um, the light profiles as well. And now to shift attention to station E1, we've got much longer time series at station E1, but we don't sample quite as frequently. So we sample uh, once a fortnight at station E1. And um, so we've got this, this, this is again is to show you sort of how uh, the, 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 the vertical profile in temperature. So again, it's well mixed um, sort of for the winter months and into the early spring. And then uh, again, the, the, the longer days, the, the higher intensity of the sunlight gives you this, this much warmer surface layer. And the surface layer at E1 would generally extend down to about, uh, about 20 meters down. And sometimes you can get temperatures that are about six degrees above. So that the temperature above the thermocline is about six degrees warmer than below the thermocline in the middle of the summer. So what does this mean in terms of temperature anomalies during uh, 2020? So what I've got here is the plot. This is for station L4. So we've got um, consistent electronic data going back to about the late 80s at L4. Um, and this shows you the temperature anomaly plot. What do I mean by that? Well, it's the, the temperature that's actually recorded minus the average temperature for each of the months. So it basically de-seasonalizes the data. If you don't de-seasonalize the data, you get data, data like this, but that means that then you can plot your um, actual individual uh, time plots against what you'd expect in the average. So this is the surface temperature, and this is the 50 meter temperature. Uh, so at 50 meters is very close to the bottom. L4 is about 50, 55 meters in depth. Um, so this is what uh, the temperature looks like on average. So in an average year, pretty much the minimum temperature that you record at L4 is about or just shy of nine degrees in sort of March time, gets up to around about 16, 70 degrees in the summertime. These dotted lines here are your envelope of variability. So this is about one standard deviation away from the average. And what we found in 2020 was that the closer you get to this solid line, the closer to average you are, the closer you are to this lower dotted line, the, the colder or on average it is, and then the closer you get to the upper dotted line, uh, the, the warmer it is on average. So what do we see is that we see there was a warm start um, to the year, or so to the springtime, as you'd expect with the meteorology, but then you found that during the, the, during the summertime, uh, sort of the mid-summer, it was co much cooler uh, than average and mixed. So that's when we had our uh, sort of very disappointing uh, July, and that's all the way through the water column that you're seeing this effect much smaller variability in terms of the temperature 50 meters down, uh, which is to be expected. And then we had this late summer heat wave sort of in sort of the middle to the end part of August, which really heated up that surface layer very dramatically. And this is when we get the breakdown in stratification and you get the sort of equalization of temperature all the way through the water column. And then shifting our attention to the salinity anomalies. So this is um, salinity. This is the average salinity at L4 at the surface. This is the average salinity at 50 meters down. Um, and last year was pretty fresh in terms of uh, salinity. So to the start of the year, this is where we had the exceptional February rainfall. Um, we're getting uh, salinities somewhere between half to 
0.7 of a PSU lower, but on average, it was about 0.1 to 0.2 lower than average. And then 50 meters, we're, we're again fresh all the way through the water column. We're about 0.1 to 0.2 PSU lower than the average. That's just reiterating what I've said. And then looking at E1, so we've got data going back to 1903 at station E1. So this is the early time series before the first war between the wars and then um, pretty much continuous since uh, the, the, the late 1940s. So this is um, maintained by the MBA and uh, by ourselves sort of in the latter part of the series. Um, and you can see uh, in terms of the temperature time series, again, quite mixed in the middle part of the year, but then this um, late summer heat wave, you can see quite clearly. Um, and then the stratification breakdown again at, at E1. And then finally, this is my final slide. Uh, this is just showing the, the salinity. The salinity was pretty much about uh, sort of just below average at, at E1 with its just brief incursion of, of higher salinity waters, which could have been associated with the uh, coccolith for bloom, but that's, uh, that's an open question. Okay, so I'll leave it there. And then I find that I've run over by a huge amount. So Jack, take control. Hello. <laughs> Great, thanks, Tim. Um, so, yeah, we've not, like you said, we've got, gone over a little bit, but we've got a couple of questions um, in the Q&A. So, uh, first of all, Bill La has asked, um, why use the 1981 to 2010 as a reference series and not 81 to 2020? Right, so... Um, that was referring to the, older, the in, earlier in, slide. Yeah, sure. So that that's refers to the climatological average uh, period. So currently, meteorolo meteorologically, the uh, the rolling period is from 1981 to 2010 that we compare our temperatures against. By next year, it will go to 1991 to 2020 that we will then compare our temperatures and uh, sunshine and rainfall against. So there's always this 30 year climatological period. So when it, when they appear on the on the weather forecast and they say this was much warmer than the average, the average that they're talking about generally is that climatological average and it's always a 30 year period and it's always a 30 year period that you're not in and it always ends in a year beginning with a zero and starts the year beginning with a one. <laughs> Okay, that's a very good answer. I didn't make the rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no, WMO, it's a World Meteorological Organization thing. Yeah, standard. Okay, that, 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 that makes sense. Um, Bill said okay. <laughs> 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 I think that's answered his question. Um, okay, um, Keith has asked. Um, Keith said, uh, thank you, Tim. Transmission seemed high at the time of Phaeocystis May water bloom in late May. Does dense plankton adversely affect transmission, or have I got in a muddle? and expect shading when the bloom is on. It, it should do, Keith. I haven't looked at the data um, in detail with, with regards to the transmission. The thing that we probably want to look at is the fluorescent signal to see whether or not we're picking up the, um, the phaeocystis correctly. Interesting thing with phaeocystis is often it's quite, it, it forms colonies, so it's quite clumpy when it goes through the, uh, the various instruments. So often you find it's quite spiky in terms of the fluorescent signal. But also the same could be said for the transmission. Um, but we can look at we can look at that in detail if we're interested. If you're interested to do that. Okay. Thank you. So that's uh, all the questions for now. I think. Um, so should we head over to Angus? Oh, hang on. Someone's got their hand up. Um, sorry, Bob. I'll let Bob's Bob's got a question. Maybe you can turn your mic on, Bob. Yeah. Uh, um, Tim, that's great stuff. Um, is there, uh, I know the name storms are really kind of focusing people's attention to these things, but is there any emerging pattern with these? I, I, I remember in Beast for the Eastland, or when there was a really very strong one, I think two or three years ago now, it really had a very devastating effect on a lot of the, you know, the South Coast, you know, relative to, you know, some of the Southwesterlies, which... So I just wonder whether you, you had any sense of, uh, uh, sort of any emerging patterns or not. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I kind of shy away from these kind of, uh, because we, could, we almost end up in the land of anecdotes and things like that, don't you? <laughs> um, 
I don't think there is an emerging pattern. I mean, actually, if I think back to to when I was younger, uh, sort of in the sort of in the eighties, that we had this period of of you know successive winters, 80, 86 and eighty seven. I remember we had yeah. some pretty strong easterly winds that were probably on a par with the beast from the east. Yeah. Um, and then if you go right back in time to about the 1890s, I believe that there was this horrific uh, easterly that, that sort of started in about the middle, or mid to the end of March 1890, I think it was, and decimated the whole south coast. And, and they were digging, you know, how much you believe of this, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to go back to the historical records of the time, but they were digging animals out of snowdrifts still in May. You know, there's mm. these kind of, you know, I don't know, that's probably yeah. an exaggeration. You know, and then you look at the winters of, of, of 47 and 63, and they were, you know, f- by far more extreme than what we've had here. And I think the other thing is about these, these sort of beast from the East things is that they were very, they were pretty short lived actually. Um, you know, they were only really a period of about a week or so. Whereas if you think back to where well, you can't, you probably won't be able to, no, you won't be able to remember this. Gerald will be able to remember this. And I've seen that Gerald's online. Um, you, you know, the, the winter of, of 47 was, was a particularly bad from the, about the end of January th- and through the whole of February and people were burning their clothes to stay warm. So, you know, these, 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 uh, there isn't, I don't think that there is a particular pattern in any of this. That's my that's my personal view. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Bill said 1963, very long. It was yes, in the, in the, in the, so. and it froze up to Calstock. <laughs> well, <laughs> apparently. Okay, so I'm um, sure it yeah, <laughs> I'm sure Gerald will uh, jump on at the end of his first time. Um, okay, brilliant. So um, should we move on to Angus now, Tim? You, yep, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Okay. Okay, hi Angus. Do you want to share your share my screen? Screen over. Can you all see that? Yeah, yeah, looks can, good. And you can hear me all right. So yeah, I'll Lovely. start because I, I realise we're a little bit over time. So um, I'll be talking maybe for 20, 30 minutes just to give people a, a rough idea. Um, but I first want to say thank you first to the organisers and. Um, for inviting me and also these people I've named. Um, I think everybody here is from the various Plymouth Institutes, um, my own Plymouth Marine Laboratory, um, the Marine Biological Association and of course the University of Plymouth. So thank you and also I should say thank you to people who've sent records in. I haven't um, records of plankton, I haven't put all of these on but hopefully we can capture most of them in the Southwest Marine Ecosystems annual report. So just trying to advance slide. It's quite a big file so I think it takes a while to catch up with me. Anyway the introduction I'll just sort of set the scene for the geography of the West Country um, observations. Um, A little bit about um, planktonic food webs and how we monitor plankton and of course followed by the um, 2020 plankton observations but a large part of this talk is actually placing these 2020 observations into the wider scale context that's longer term trends and larger scale northeast Atlantic pattern and very briefly at the end talking a bit about extreme weather. So um, to set the scene with the geography, this is a satellite image of sea surface temperature in the um, summer months. So the yellows and the oranges towards the um, southwest of the UK are this stable stratified water that um, Tim mentioned. This is the um, surface water above the seasonal thermocline. Um, contrast that um, stable water that's heating up in the summer with the inshore water um, that is the sort of blues and the purples that's tidally mixed and for example in the Irish Sea and close inshore and I'll be talking quite a lot about the L4 site in particular that Tim Smythe introduced. 
Um, so a, a typical plankton food web or food chain that you might get in a textbook could look something like this. You get spring and autumn blooms of respectively typically diatoms in the spring, dinoflagellates in the autumn that are fed on by um, crustacean grazers um, dominated by these small copepods. Um, Calamus helgolandicus is the biomass dominant in the West Country, a couple of millimetres long. In turn, um, supporting planktivorous fish and the larvae of other fish. So as well as um, sort of good quantities of food coming through in these blooms, it's important to stress that the diatoms and the dinoflagellates, the primary producers at the base of the food web, are also producing these omega-3 fatty acids. And I'm going to come on to this issue of food quality a little bit later on in the talk. I've said the copepods are, um, are dominant in the zooplankton. Um, the copepods are the blue. This is the seasonal histogram of the composition of the biomass at our L4 monitoring site. So the copepods are, um, are the single sort of major group, but they only comprise about half of the biomass. Um, a significant portion at some times of the year are these what I call mirror plankton. These are the pelagic larvae of benthic invertebrates. I've given an example of a crab larvae here. Um, there's also other components, um, for example, the gelatinous zooplankton in those various shades of orange. Um, so I think it's important to say that this is our monitoring. I'm going to talk about um, quite a lot um, this afternoon, but it is at just one site and it is with relatively small nets for the zooplankton. It's half metre ring nets that have been sampled at weekly resolution since 1988. So that's not providing the full picture of all of the zooplankton. So, for example, they don't catch the huge barrel jellyfish. Um, and that's where the records that are sent in for these Southwest Marine Ecosystems reports, that's where they come into their own. And I've illustrated these um, reported observations with a nice um, little time series that's been sent in from Lundy um, for their Field Society annual report. And that's actually really useful because it's got observations of these barrel jellyfish right through the year. So you can see, for example, clusters of observations in that fine settled weather that we had in April, May in the spring of last year. Um, so that's providing an extra dimension for the zooplankton observations with these uh, records that are sent in for things that uh, are not really represented in the L4 time series. Another good example is um, records of felt washed up on the Isles of Scilly. I think that was following that storm, that um, September, August, September storm that Tim mentioned. So the interesting thing about that is that we don't get these salps at L4 and they're probably an oceanic species. So the records are giving a very good indication of the wider scale picture, including more oceanic. So reporting these time trends in plankton, as I've mentioned, we've got the Southwest Marine Ecosystems um, reports, which I think Bob can correct me up. I think they've been going on for about nine or 10 years. Um, and that's actually useful because it's very up to date. It's reporting not in sort of real time, but only um, sort of a year or so um, after the event, absolute max. So that's quite an up, up to date record of unusual observations and time series of the marine environment compared to other reports which are increasing in their time and space resolution. So for example, these so-called MSIP reports reporting on not just plankton but other organisms right across the Northeast Atlantic. Wider scale still are these IPCC reports which are also giving best guesses for what's going to happen in the future. So there's also um, monitoring um, that we have to do as a legal requirement, not just for plankton, but for other components of the um, pelagic or the marine food web. Um, I'm in the UK Pelagics Habitats expert group, and that's got a real nuclear stand in Plymouth. It's headed up by Abigail McQuatters Gollop from the University of Plymouth. And um, the a lot of the sort of indicator development work has come out of the Plymouth 
institutes and also Plymouth is at the epicenter of the um, some of the monitoring, or at least it's got some of the best monitoring in terms of plankton. Um, we've got the continuous plankton recorder survey based at the Marine Biological Association. Um, I've given, I've listed on this um, map um, the various UK time series by a whole suite of agencies and um, institutes that are providing plankton time series, and you can see. Um, the largest in terms of time coverage, in terms of timeline, is with, with this continuous plankton recorder. It's been going since the 50s for phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, second most is the PML's L4 site that I've already mentioned. Um, and that's slightly closer in um, um, than the mainly oceanic and offshore CPR survey. And um, we've also got environment agency monitoring that's right in shore around coasts and estuaries for phytoplankton, and that's for water quality. So we're very well, very well served with um, time series in the West Country. So that's the introduction. Um, now, um, some of the observations, and I think the major single observation that is unusual in 2020 were these coccolithophore blooms. Tim's already touched on the issue. I'll go a little bit wider scale with these blooms because um, they developed quite a lot of media attention at their peak in late June, early July, and generated some of these beautiful satellite images of sort of ghost-like swirls in the water um, in the Northern English Channel in particular. And I think they were the largest blooms recorded in the English Channel. So I love these satellite images. If you just zoom up on that last one, it's um, fantastic resolution. You can see ships charging around, stirring up the fine structure in these suspended um, coccolithophore um, plates. Um, these are called liths of the, the calcareous plates of the, um, the small um, Emiliana Huxleyi um, blooms that are in the surface waters. And as I said, these were in late June, early July, and they were mainly offshore, as I'll show in a minute, and they were thought to um, be um, more um, sort of offshore and developing um, after um, sort of settled weather that allowed the water to stratify. That's the, th that's the thinking behind it anyway. Um, so there's another alternative view of the um, coccolithophore blooms. This is again the satellites. This is colour enhanced and um, it shows, um, I'm going to show a sequence of slides to show the, um, the generation of these um, coccolithophore blooms and their very quick decay. So this was early June. The blooms were just starting south of Cornwall and um, this was accompanied by a series of tweets by Peter Miller at the PML and he was identifying the coccolithophore blooms as these patches of sort of milky white that you can see and also other um, algal types. So this colour enhancement, it's not just to generate um, pretty pictures, it's to get an insight into the type of phytoplankton that is actually causing these blooms. So he also mentions Carinia mikimotai, that's a dinoflagellate, not a coccolithophore, and that's important because it's a potentially harmful species, and so this satellite imagery can be used, for example, to give some early warning for harmful blooms for the shellfish farming industry, for example. So that's early June. The bloom was in full swing come the end of June, but it died as quickly as it started um, by middle of July. Peter summed it up very well. Um, blooms seem to have their own virus issues. Um, they're probably um, um, reduced by virus attack rather than grazing by zooplankton. So um, you might have seen in the um, end of June image, the blooms were tended to be a little bit offshore in the, in the um, stably stratified water. An exception was around the Isles of Scilly. And there's a very nice blog from the Isles of Scilly um, that's um, quite informative about the bloom. 
and you can it's got some beautiful pictures such as this of this sort of chalky turquoise blue color of the water around the Isles of Scilly. So we're also picking up the bloom at our monitoring even though it's slightly um, inshore of the peak of the bloom. Um, this is flow cytometry data um, showing the weekly resolution samples and I should point out that um, I'm not sure if Tim said but we we sampled through the um, the COVID lockdown we were given um, a special dispensation to carry on um, sampling and continuing these valuable time series with appropriate um, social distancing so that was um, very very um, valuable because it allowed us to continue these time series and show the extent of this bloom and the very sharp spike which is a, a very a spiky um, sort of nature even by um, phytoplankton standards. Um, so there's um, that flow cytometry data which from surface water samples um, from depth profiles for flow cytometry but there's a longer time series of um, water samples that are analysed by Claire Widdicombe, that's dating from um, late 1992. So we've got a very good picture of year-to-year -year variability in phytoplankton, such as these coccolithophores. Um, so you see 2020 is um, a pretty unusual year, but there were previously um, high years, for example, 2011. Also um, previously mentioned this um, dinoflagellate um, that is potentially harmful. So the summer of 2020, um, which is um, the yellow shaded area, and that's the red mark, um, the red trace, which is 2020 compared to the long-term average. It was a relatively good summer, both for the coccolithophores and for these Carinia blooms. And they're not thought to be, um, when they're blooming at um, sort of almost monospecific blooms, it's not thought to be such good food for the grazers. Um, the better food is some of the other items that um, Claire counts, namely the diatoms, dinoflagellates, the smaller flagellates, she's counting sort of four micron up, nanoflagellates, also ciliates, so that's good food. And all of these seem to be around in slightly lower biomass in 2020 than in a more typical sort of average year. So putting all those data together for all of the cell um, types um, bigger than roughly four microns that Claire counts, so that's basically um, zooplankton food. Um, that is the time series of the mean annual biomass right from when the monitoring started at L4, showing 2020 in the context of the previous measurements. Um, the really interesting thing, slightly surprising to me, um, when these data are plotted, there is some evidence for a declining trend, which I, I find in, um, particularly interesting because it's such a solid data set. It's got over a thousand sampling points, so it's getting on for a quarter of a million records over 28 years. And it's a declining trend, not just in total um, phytoplankton biomass, but in multiple important groups, mainly by nanoflagellates, also by dinoflagellates and diatoms. So that raises a few questions. How does it sort of affect the rest of the food web? Are, are there any trends in the zooplankton? This is the biomass dominant um, zooplankton at L4, Calamus helgolandicus, this two and a half millimeter copepod. Um, a couple of years ago, we were saying the numbers were holding fairly steady. Um, but the last couple of years, we've seen a little bit of a drop off in their abundance. In, in parallel to the phytoplankton. Um, so that is a little bit puzzling. Looking at it in more detail, it seems to be mainly a summer thing. So the drop off is mainly lower abundances in the summer. So we're quite lucky at the L4 site because we've got a beautiful time series of the egg production of Calanus. I think this is the one of the longest time series of zooplankton egg production anywhere. And it shows a sort of heat map of seasonal um, monthly average egg production right from the start of this time series. So it go, goes from these reds, the maximum about 50 eggs per female today, 
per day down to the minimum, which is zero. So it holds fairly steady with peak values in sort of between April and June for most of the time series. But then after about 2007, it seems to shift a little bit later in the year and the egg production in the middle or the, the sort of spring summer months seems to be showing a little bit of a drop off. We haven't got the data for some of these um, the 2020 um, plotted up yet for the zooplankton so looking forward to getting that but that's quite an interesting time series because it seems to parallel the the drop off in food in the recent years so we we're wondering whether um, the two trends are linked whether the, the decline in the feeding conditions is behind a decline in some of these um, zooplankton and some of the other zooplankton, the smaller zooplankton, um, for example, Pseudocalamus, Tamora and Akasha, they've actually showed quite dramatic declines at the L4 site. These are actually, um, this is on a log scale um, abundance over time since um, the sampling started in 1988. So they are showing some of them get nearly an order of magnitude decline. But looking at it in a little bit more detail, the pit is um, a bit more complicated. So the copepods have declined, um, the food has declined, or at least the larger food has declined, but these miraplankton, that's the pelagic larvae of the benthic invertebrates, they've increased. So that's a bit puzzling. They've increased to L4, that's the plot on the left, but um, there's um, this, um, plankton monitoring for policy, that's the plot on the right, um, Jake Bedford's paper in 2020, that's collating all the time series, um, measuring um, changes in miraplankton. And there seems to be a UK and at least some sort of Northwest European wide shelf extent increase in miraplankton since the 50s and it's roughly doubled. So what we seem to be seeing is a partial replacement of miraplankton um, of, of copepods with miraplankton. So we wanted to find out what was going on. There's a, it's a bit sort of puzzling why these long-term trends are actually happening. So we did a little bit of detective work at a, a range of scales. And we started off um, looking at the largest scale that we had good data for. And that's just um, wider than, even than UK. It's a, a sort of Northeast Atlantic scale and a long-term scale. So that was um, this paper, another paper in Global Change Biology. And that is combining the CPR data, that's for the zooplankton and phytoplankton that I've already mentioned, with satellite imagery. Satellite imagery is going from 97, 98, and the CPR is going from um, 1958. So, Looking at the trend, these histograms are the monthly plots of the positive, it's like um, positive and negative anomalies um, or slope of trend um, over the just the last 20 years illustrated here. This is just for phytoplankton. So this is the um, satellite imagery showing that in the summer months, that's that yellow stratified period, there's a general decline in the phytoplankton, a decline in chlorophyll A across this whole area. And that decline is parallel to a change in its composition. The bottom load of histograms shows that more of these cells are small, and by small I mean pico size, which is smaller than about two microns. So it's too, basically too small for the copepods to eat. So it's sort of double trouble for the, um, for the copepods. There's less food and what is left is a bit, is getting increasingly small. So this is the pattern across the whole Northeast Atlantic um, sector for the copepods. This is based on CPR data, and it actually parallels what we found at L4. There's basically a decline of um, copepods in the summer months. So that's the large scale picture. So we honed in a little bit um, with the um, with this analysis, looking at um, the, um, the West Country, 
and that's based on the L4 site and um, the um, some process cruisers in the Celtic Sea a couple of years ago. And they sort of pointed to these, um, what we call Sinecococcus, um, that's the name for picocyanobacteria, only a couple of microns long. So these are in the pico size fraction. And these seem to be um, doing very, very well in these warm stratified nutrient stress conditions that we seem to be increasingly getting um, certainly in the Celtic Sea, but also increasingly even at L4. So this um, plot on the right is showing on the y-axis the dominance of this Sinecococcus against the nutrient status. And we've had a series of dry summers in the last couple of years. And in these, the Sinecococcus seem to be able to outcompete the other small cells. So that is providing a possible mechanism for the changes in the composition of the zooplankton and the phytoplankton. So the working idea, the sort of hypothesis that we've got is that we're beginning to move away from this sort of classic efficient food web that I mentioned at the start, which was fueled by these omega-3 rich fatty acid rich um, diatoms and dinoflagellates. And we're moving into a food web that's dominated by small primary producers, um, for example, these picocyanobacteria, the Sinecococcus, were supporting a microbial food chain. And it's just an idea, but it's possible that the miraplankton are able to eat some of these small cells. And maybe that's why they're um, doing better and actually increasing and partially replacing the copepods. But um, obviously needs quite a lot of work and there's other causes. But I think the, the sort of take home message from all of this is that we're seeing major coherent changes in the food web, not just around um, the West Country, but right across the Northeast Atlantic sector. And that's pointing to climate change, large scale effects being the driver. And they're so pervasive, we're not actually seeing the signal from any pollution events um, or OA or plastic pollution, eutrophication or fishing. Any signal from them seems to be drowned out by the climate change. So I'm conscious of the time, we've slightly overshot um, between Tim and I, but I'll quickly go on to um, extreme events. Um, we've talked a little bit, bit about dry um, weather and um, heat waves and things like that um, that are favouring small cells. I'll talk a little bit more about storm activity um, because um, along with other extreme weather, um, storm activity and intensity is projected to increase in a warmer world. Um, so this is where some of the observations and um, records um, come in. Um, um, valuable um, observations, um, mass strandings of some of the gelatinous component of the zooplankton. Um, this is after a series of storms right at the beginning of the year before the lockdown. Um, that's a series of named storms that Tim was mentioning. Uh, Portuguese man of war um, washed ashore. This is a picture by Keith Hiscock. I think it's at Trigantel, um, but lots of records up and down the coast. Likewise, um, by the wind sailors, um, Valella. And so those, those increases on the beaches and they're paralleled by decreases of gelatinous zooplankton in the water column. This isn't um, 2020, we haven't actually analyzed the data, but we did a study of those memorable storms back in 2013, 2014. I think they were sort of described as one in a hundred year storms. It was actually a series of storms going from December, 2013 to March, 2014. And we were able to sample L4 in between all these storms. And that um, showed that there was a fairly stable phytoplankton, um, quite surprisingly. And the thing that seemed to be hit was the zooplankton, in particular, the gelatinous zooplankton, I guess because they're delicate, but there was also quite a lot of copepod carcasses um, in the water, suspended in the water and um, relatively higher mortality um, of the copepods in that period. So it's obviously having some effect, but the interesting thing is it seems to um, 
bounce back to a normal sort of situation literally within only a couple of months and you'd never realize anything had happened. So it seems to be fairly resilient. So um, I think um, because these um, storms are such um, catastrophic events, and um, particularly when they're intensive, for example, the 2013, 2014 storms, really valuable to keep these records coming in and um, to um, contribute to the annual reports. And I think this is my last slide. Um, I've talked about um, satellite data um, and I've talked about time series observations and the records that are sent in. And each of these are complementary. Um, they tell you different things about the plankton. They're over different scales. So that they look at it in different ways. Um, and I think all three type of observational approaches are really valuable in this reporting. So this is um, an image that um, Daniel Cluley sent me from, I think it was, yeah, it was just last week. So it's sort of bringing us up to date and it's showing what looks like um, the origins of the spring phytoplankton bloom happening very early um, in some places. So this is a, a really good pointer to, um, to actually not just use the blooms to get, um, use the um, satellite imagery to get um, nice pictures. It gives you valuable numbers on things like bloom timing and extent, for example. So that's it from me. Um, in case you've wandered off or dozed off, these are the sort of punchline conclusions. Um, it wasn't a big jelly year by um, the records that came in, but I think the single unusual thing was the extent of these midsummer coccolithophore blooms, and also putting the 2020 into its correct context with a, a potential decline in the traditional food web from dinoflagellates, diatoms through copepods up to the fish and superimposed storm effects which are really valuable to study. So thanks once again to all the contributors and the compilers of these records. So that's it, thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, thanks very much, Angus. Um, we've got, I think we've probably got time for a couple of questions <laughs> quickly. Um, that was a really interesting talk, thank you. Um, so we've got, so the first question, uh, Bill um, has asked, how does Carinia relate to Jaridinium? I'm not sure exactly whether that means taxonomically or... Um, I think one thing, I, I'm not an expert in dinoflagellates other than to say they are both dinoflagellates. I don't think gyrodinium, um, well, it's um, both of gyrodinium and um, carinia are genus names, and they've got variable, certainly among carinia, it's got variable, variable degrees of toxicity. And I think uh, there's quite a lot of um, sort of unfinished scientific research on how the toxicity actually works. Um, because there's, a, um, there's quite a sort of controversy among sort of zooplankton ecologists on how toxicity works and where um, poor nutritional value stops and where toxicity begins, for example. So I know some gyrodinium are actually very, very good um, food for zooplankton. Okay. Well, he said he um, looked those up. Yeah, he said he said he'll look them up. Um, and he said he, he remembers studying them off um, off of Ireland in the 70s. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, um, James Lord asked a question. Um, I think he's posted a follow-up to that question. So I think you answered the question. He was asking about um, what was driving the declines observed in phytoplankton abundance, but I think you covered that. So he's asked a follow-on question there, um, asking, does the new plankton community composition represent a less healthy ecosystem, um, i.e. less resilient, more volatile than the old one or simply a different ecosystem? Well, I think the first thing to say is that it's not, I, th I think we should be a little bit careful about talking about replacement because um, all of the time there are um, 
it's not just a series of food chains, um, it's a food web, and the strength of some of the links in the food web can be stronger or weaker than the other. So we've always got the microbial food web, even that when we've got a diatom bloom, the microbial food web is actually um, quite um, enhanced even within a diatom bloom. So it's not a case of either or. or. In terms of resilience, that's another um, quite tricky question. And I think um, it's actually a, a very interesting question um, whether th these different types of food chain have got different degrees of resilience. So I, th I think I've sort of waffled a bit and bridled around the answer. I think the short answer is that we, we don't really know yet. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, Susan Fraser asked what salps are, but there's uh, a link been posted to, um, to, to an article about it. But I don't know if you want to very quickly say what salps are. Um, yeah, I th one thing I didn't say is that um, they're quite different to a lot of the other gelatinous zooplankton, which are predatory. The salps are actually um, filter feeders, and they're one of the little exceptions um, to the general rule that zooplankton cannot filter small food particles. Um, the salps and appendicularians to which they're related, um, they filter actually through a mesh a mucus mesh, so they can actually catch bacteria sized food items. So that's their main difference. A lot of the jellies um, are larger, uh, feeding on larger food items, but even within them, there's a huge difference in um, the sort of size of things that they capture. So for example, the barrel jellyfish, which I illustrated, um, it can actually catch relatively small food items. So there's a big diversity in what they can catch. Okay. Oh, that's that's interesting. So that all connects. Um, okay, we've got um, a hand up. Um, oh, it's Bob. Bob's got a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll let you unmute, Bob. You posted a couple of questions in the chat as well, so um, yeah. I'll let you uh, vocalise those. Uh, yeah, Tim and Angus, um, great to see you guys. You know, thanks very much indeed for you know, all the efforts you've put into this. You know, it's really, really helpful. I mean, I, I've sat um, and watched the you know, the previous 10 webinars, um, certainly with the mobile species, the, you know, where you suddenly realise that the tuna are coming from, well, where they're coming from, the Bay of Biscay or going to the Mediterranean or going out into the Atlantic, you know, the larger scale of things um, becomes apparent as there was a wonderful you know, slide of Balearic shearwaters pretty much stopping at the front. You know, so the, the distribution of these things is fairly interesting. Uh, just a, a couple of links that are kind of, um, just kind of crossed over into the sort of stuff that you've been saying. I mean, the basking shark sightings over the last few years have really been going down very significantly. And I, and I know from my misspent youth studying basking sharks for about six or seven years that they are absolutely shit hot at finding callous. Um, and and one can't help thinking. And again, there's you know. So I think in the fullness of time, when people come back to look at your calendar's records, there may well be quite a kind of correlation between what's happening to the calendar, um, the success of calendars in the southwest and, and what happened, is happening to the basking shark. I think there was one other, um, anyway, so I mean, I think, the, I, I'm gonna say so perhaps one more thing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, the, to a point at which we can expose you guys to all of those other people who, who we're picking up the effects of what you guys are actually yeah, measuring in the sense that all of this is interrelated. All, all the stuff that you guys do underpins everything else that everyone's picking up on the natural history side of things. And, and of course, you know, in, in breaking the things up into a very, very, very traditional way, like all well, plankton and oceanography and birds and benthos and all these kind of things, it makes those kind of particular groups very happy, but it doesn't you know, break them out of their silos. So it's actually kind of really quite important, I think, when we get back to interactive meetings to actually sort of go into silo breaking because it becomes really important to understand the kind of connect connections between fronts and plankton and, and seasonality of various things. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I will come back and, and kind of you know, pick up on, on a few of the things you know, by email, but you know, we thank you both for, for your contribution to this because it is you know, pretty damn fundamental to everything we're doing. Nothing less. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a second. I think to say a, 
a final word. But has anybody else got any other questions they'd like to to pose? No, I think we're good now. Okay, um, so thanks very much, guys. Um, really interesting talks. Uh, if anyone has got other questions, I'm sure you'd be happy for them to contact you. Is that right? <laughs> I know you sort of hinted as such, but I didn't want to. Uh... <laughs> there is a there is a hand that's gone up somewhere. Ooh, Jack, is there Ooh, I don't know where though. Oh no! Oh, it's Gerald. Hang on, Gerald. Oh, fantastic. Um, hang on a second. Okay, Gerald, you should be allowed to turn your microphone on now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear you loud and clear? Um, first of all, um, Garodinium and Carinia. Carinia originally was Garodinium. When it first arrived, I identified it as, gar as a species of Garodinium. Do you get that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then to talking about the bad winters, in 1963-64, when we had the very bad winter, it didn't start until the end of February. It went on until April. We had snow on Dartmoor up till April, and the train from Plymouth to Princetown was snowed in, and they had to dig it out. And they were actually dropping bread to Princetown by helicopter. Was that, an e was that an easterly winter, Gerald, or, or yeah. an easterly sort of late February, March period? Yeah, yeah, it was a late February, March winter. And, and it was east, and it was an easterly. I'm guessing yeah, it must have been an easterly. We had very deep snow, and um, as I say, the train from Plymouth to Princeton, which was running in those days, was snowed in, and they had, took two or three days to dig it out. I think. And they were dropping bread to Princeton by helicopter. Well, well there you go. Right. Thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I think 47 was late as well, though. I think that that was at the very end of January. And then yeah. that was a whole month of February being yeah, very, 40, very cold. 47, I think I was still at the grammar school. Yes, I was. And I remember walking to school through snow up to my waist. And we walked from Beer to Cotton, which was a three mile walk. Okay. Yes, thank you for that, Gerald. I, I, knew, I knew you'd have an opinion on it or an observation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's good to hear you, Gerald, as well. Yeah, good to see you, Jack. <laughs> Um, right, I think it's probably time to wrap up now. Um, so, just... yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, anyone? Did someone just say? Yeah, Can sorry, I... Angus. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted no, to no, say no. if anybody's got any other records that they haven't already contributed um, for Plankton from 2020, um, you can send them directly to myself or to one of the organisers, and then hopefully we can get them into the report for this year. Right. That's all? Yeah. You, you, um, you said exactly what I was just about to say then. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Thank you, Angus. Um, so yeah, like, like Angus said, please share any, any reports. That goes for any of the other, um, for the other topics as well that have been covered in the, um, in the series of, uh, of, of, of webinars as well. Um, if you've missed any of the webinars as well, it's worth pointing out um, that they're all recorded and they'll all be available on YouTube and through the Southwest Marine Ecosystem website. Um, okay, so finally, just like to say thank you to Tim and Angus um, for speaking today. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, Bob, I don't know if you wanted to say, as this is the last one, if you wanted to say a few words just to, to wrap up the, um, the, uh, the, the series. Well, you should be able to yeah, send your mic. Very quickly then. Um, first of all, I should say thank you to Jack. But, you know, for facilitating the webinars from, you know, from the MBA um, and, and obviously, you know, from, from to Martin and, and various people and, and Brendan from Exeter for, for doing that technical support stuff. It's been great. And, it, and they've worked really well and we've we had some really good um, sessions. Um, you know, Keith and I are now working on the report, as are all the editors. Um, it's been, a, you, know, you know, it's been an interesting exercise. And it's been a you know, fascinating sort of process. And one thing... I, in doing a talk recently, I had to do for um, Hempseg, 
I suddenly realized, of course, and, and, and Angus alluded to this, is that, that, you know, these reports are coming out annually and quite a lot of you know, stuff happens or quite a lot of management related stuff and quite a lot of research related stuff happens really within a kind of really quite confined time scale. And to give you an example, um, obviously, you know, OSPALM, Restrategy, all that kind of thing tends to report on a five yearly scale. Whereas, in fact, what we're doing, I kind of see, you know, it's got its imperfections. But at least it, you know, it's flagging certain issues um, in, in the kind of short term. And I mean, the, obviously, the tuna story is, is a pretty good example of that, where we've gone from just strange observations, you know, seem peculiar, but to the point where now everyone takes tuna for granted, almost. So it's, it's rather interesting in the way this is kind of happening and working. But anyway, thank you very much, Jack. And thank you for everyone who's contributed and taken part. It's been a great success. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob, for putting them together. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and um, yeah, I look forward to seeing all of the recorded talks and uh, the annual report when it comes out. Um, I'm going to close the session now. So uh, goodbye. Bye. <laughs>